I'm Andy Nidell, and this is another Great War live stream weapons special today featuring Russian rifles of the First World War. And my expert guest this time and every time is Othias from CN Arsenal. Now, if you don't know what that channel is, there'll be links below. Um, he goes into great detail on, weapon, on all kinds of weapons, but has a particular series on the small arms of the First World War. And when I say goes into detail, I mean goes into detail. So if you're weapons fans or World War I fans, you should definitely check, out, check that out in the link below. So, Othias, hello and thank you for being here. Hey, Andy. Uh, we are back. This time, instead of Russian handguns, we have Russian rifles. So, uh, whenever you are ready, I can start digging into this. But if you are curious about these things, like Andy said, come over and see our primer series on CN Arsenal. And also, it's always good to have that intermingled for those people who watch my show. This is a good time for you to start checking out The Great War so that you can see the context around all of these things. And of course, for people who watch my show, this is a good time to watch his so show so you can really see the detail that I am not able to cover in any of our episodes with the minutiae of the weapons. So that's great. Well, bring one out and let's just dive into it, yeah? All right. Now, uh, last time I worked from oldest to newest. In this case, I'm kind of doing the same, but it just won't seem so right at first. Now, when we talk about Russia, the first thing that everybody's going to think about is, of course, oh, the Mosin Nagant. Now, this is the model 1891. This is a fairly World War I issue styled gun. We have our sort of parade style sling. We have our scutcheons for our leather sling loops. This thing has a full handguard, and we have our sort of rounded top sights. Although this is not how the gun started. Back in 1891, it had some very unique features in that it didn't have a handguard. It had a flat top Nagant style sight, and it had a sort of finger rest, a semi pistol grip metallic piece that was added so that you could really pull that thing into your shoulder. Now, by the time of World War I, this thing's undergone a couple updates. Number one, it's been adapted to a Spitzer cartridge, which means that we've changed the rear sight. We've also added a handguard to help with heat mirage and handling. And then, honestly, eventually this will go away, this little sling swivel, although that's going to be sort of during the war era. Now, I know what you guys are thinking. You want a closer look, so let's zoom on in. This is the heart of the action, which is that this is a bolt action, five shot stripper clip fed, gun. Now, this gun as adopted in 1891, again, like that Nagant 1895 we talked about, is a bit out of date already. These also have a terrible reputation in the U.S. shooting communities because of their very rough handling, inaccuracy, and just extreme difficulty in opening the system. A lot of that comes from the fact that those were refurbished. When you're dealing with an unrefurbished gun, they're actually fairly slick. However, again, like the Nagant, just the refurbishment process alone can't be put to blame for all the problems with this particular action. So there's a couple things going on. One, by 1891, we already have some pretty good Mauser designs coming out, and you can forgive the fact that this is single stack, but reasonably, within just a few short years, single stack is going to be obsolete because if we look at this spring setup, you can tell this is a fairly complicated part. We've got multiple springs, multiple arms, all finely fitted in order to drive that ammo. That's going to be a problem in terms of manufacturer versus later designs with staggered flush magazines where we just have a simple flat spring. Very simple, very easy to produce, unlike this. Now, I'm gonna return this to the action. And then, oh, if we look up top, we're going to see, first of all, I'm going to pull this bolt out. Give me one second. Oh, stiff. So, it's going to be hard for you to see on the live show, but later viewers will be able to tell that there's a slight piece of metal about where my finger is, down in there. That's a spring interrupter, so that this gun can feed rimmed ammo reliably. So the problem is with a rimmed cartridge, a cartridge that has a little rim sticking off, if you try to feed one against another, they'll get what is called rim lock. They won't be able to cycle over each other very easily. You can bevel the back of the cartridge to help with this, but reasonably there's going to be some problem, especially in a direct single stack. So this system has a sort of spring that isolates one cartridge at a time. So it'll isolate that, the next cartridge is held down here. Once that feeds, it allows the next one to pop up, locks it in. That system's great when you're feeding, although a lot of new shooters to this gun will sort of double charge, they'll overload a cartridge below that system, and they'll be confused why it won't pop back up unless they cycle the bolt dry in order to get the spring to get out of the way. Uh, I imagine if you're single loading the gun and you're not going to a full five rounds, this can be very confusing for a soldier as well, unless he's properly trained. It's just one of those weird little idiosyncrasies that you get used to with the good old Nagant. Now, 
most of the blame for the problems in the system go down to the bolt. So let's take a closer look at that. The bolt has a separate bolt head. As a matter of fact, I happen to have for my show this patented plastic pokey, so I'm just gonna get that so you can see. This bolt head is separate. This adds some strength and some interchangeability to the system, and it seems like the Russians were fixated on it. I'm going through the development of the gun right now very slowly in Cyrillic, and I'm gonna tell you that a separate bolt head was throughout the entire development process, and so this was going to be this no matter what. What they did though is in controlling the separate bolt head, unlike say the Gewehr 88, which controlled it internally using the firing pin, this is controlled externally. It's carried, it's locked over by this component right here, this, this lug that comes out over and down. And see this little guy right here, that's what's gonna retain our front end of this. This part becomes a problem. Now, some of you guys are probably familiar with Ian over at Forgotten Weapons, and I'm sorry this is oh, still stiff action. Uh, he did a mud test on one of these guns and he pointed out a dramatic flaw that I happen to agree with. Now, it's not unique to this gun. You can see the same problem on certain French rifles, although they are much older than this gun. I mean, five years, yes, but five years right at a time when arms development was really at its peak. So, if I set this down, you'll see this little air gap right there, that spot. If you get dirt, muck, or mud, or too much of anything in there, when you go to open the action, it's going to pinch it's gonna keep it from being able to go all the way up. That will lock your gun shut until you can blow it out, and there's no real way to because it's sealed up against the bottom. That little thing is very damning for the system. So, other than that, it's still not that great of a design. And the reason is this rail right here, can you see this under here? That particular part is designed to prevent this cocking piece from rotating out of battery. Now. The reason you wouldn't want that is that this thing has to stay, it's cock on open, so if the gun were fired, when we open the bolt, it's going to cock the cocking piece back. So, I'm sorry, I gotta get my own hand out of the way. So that came back. It has to be held in the back position. Now, there are some guns that can, that don't have an out of battery lock like this, and you can just accidentally bump them, and when you try to close it, it'll jam up the action, and you have to figure out to manually recock it. You can train around that, or you can make the gun sort of idiot proof. So. This system is fine that it has an out of battery lock. Most guns do of that era. This particular one, to my mind, is very weak because it sort of it sort of makes the rest of the action sluggish because it's a whole underside rail. It guides the cocking piece. There's some slop in there. There's more metal contact. There's more surfaces in contact. So unlike some of the other guns in the day, we have, if this thing starts getting sandy, muddy, rusty, we have these surfaces that must slide and glide and stay in contact. We have these surfaces for cocking, which is, in, you know, this is gonna be to every cock on open style gun is these surfaces, but regardless, we have those surfaces, we have these surfaces. We have this surface up here that must maintain contact and not get clogged up. There's so many things moving and touching in here that in order to keep it running reliably, you have to loosen up the tolerances. You have to kind of keep this stuff sort of loosely interacting so that grit and rust can sort of move around and not completely tie the action up. So I imagine that the Russians got sort of lured into loosening these guns up so that the pieces aren't quite as tightly machined fit. Well, that works to resist ice and other problems that were unique to Russia, but it's going to be a problem when you're dealing with a system where you have to constantly manually operate the bolt because it adds all this slack. So when I start to lift this thing, there's a gummy, elastic feeling and the more out of spec this gets the older it gets or if it gets refinished it just gets worse and worse to get a stiff smooth pull you're fighting more and more sort of rough surfaces that are not working well together you have elasticity between your movements so that there's sort of this yield so it can fight you you can have a bolt that's stuck and a lot of people in America have experienced this. You shoot the gun, overpressure ammo, unclean chamber, something, things get stuck. And then you want to force it open. Well, the problem is when you start putting that linear or that rotary force in there and it wants to convert to linear, there's so much give that before the bolt head rotates, you can move this almost a quarter of an inch in rotation just on the elasticity that's in the system that makes it very awkward to handle when it's not in its best condition. Um, just for people who might not have seen your channel or seen our other specials that we've done with you, you mentioned the stripper clip and we've talked about loading and different clips and stuff. Could you basically go through how a stripper clip works just for those who might not have seen any of that before? Yeah, I can do that. I uh, had to scrabble for one, but I've got one here with just a couple empty casings. It'll be good enough to show you. So let's take a closer look. The idea is that we want to be able to, it used to be single shot, so you'd fire, open it up, put a round in, 
close it, fire, open it up, put a round in. Well, that motion of rotating your arm and throwing another round in, we want to replace that with rotating your arm and throwing five rounds in, or three, or depending on the mechanism. So in this case, it's five. You would throw five in all at once. To do that, you would pre-organize them on a clip. These are just three empty casings. Uh, this was an impromptu request, so I wasn't prepped, but that's okay. Same idea. We would take this clip, put it up against the gun, and then or into that slot, and then we would just thumb all five rounds in. Uh, throwing empties in there is just going to jam this up, though, so forgive me if I don't do that. So thumb them all in, and then we discard the clip in this case because the Nagan is not very good at throwing its own clips out, and then bolt forward. That'll pick up our first one. We have four in reserve, and so the idea is that we've sped up our process five-fold, and this is perfectly acceptable for most armies at the time. Great, thank you. I, I just thought people, you know, just as sort of a, a, a primer again for, for people in general. But that was really cool. Okay, so, um, so where did they go? Uh, where are we going next? Well, there'd be several versions of the Nagan. They can be quite rare, so I'm glad to have them here today. And it's been part of our sort of setup for developing our history for our show. So the next thing that we're going to see in terms of length, because the previous one had been the infantry rifle, this is what's known as the Dragoon Rifle. Now, this is good for basically mounted infantry and cavalry because it's just a little shorter and a little handier. And by a little shorter, I mean a little shorter. We're only saving just a couple inches there. The Russians really wanted that extra barrel length for accuracy. And at the time they were using, you know, when this came out, bottlenosed, cartridge, you know, flat sights. They still wanted to keep that barrel. They weren't quite in a fast moving flat shooting Spitzer. So the short rifle revolution hadn't really hit them. But this is the closest they got to a short rifle, which is still just as long as many of the primary rifles in World War I. These would have been fitted at the time with a unique handguard that came all the way from basically this stocking point here to behind the rear sight. Those ears proved to be fragile and by World War I they cut it a little shorter like this one here. And then again, these got the Spitzer update, so the rounded rear sight. Uh, they would have been the only one with a handguard realistically in terms of long rifle until the long rifles also got given handguards. So features from this got moved over to the main rifle. This thing had originally was sort of the handier one, the mobile one. Now these still were around for World War I. These were still produced all the way up until like 1930 when actually this design became standard for the Russian army in terms of bolt action in the 9130. They just updated the rear sight to a tangent style instead of a ladder style and realistically kept the handguard in length. This is the precursor to the 9130 that so many people are familiar in the sort of American surplus market these days. Now again, this is not a refurb gun, it's much smoother. Uh, realistically, I have no reason to zoom in because you can just see that it's got the handguard and sort of slightly shorter length. That's really the only difference. Everything else is the same. Now if that variant then became standard in 1931, how long did that last as a standard? I mean, you know, that derivative. Uh, when can we see a change you know, even in the Second World War or beyond to something, something beyond. Well, the 9130, I should say 30, just so people don't get upset, the 9130 carried on uh, through World War II, and then Russia sort of abandons it in favor of semi-automatic rifles. But beyond that, there's a lot of Mosin collectors that will tell you the 9130 went on to a lot of communist block-style countries in different degrees of development. That's a whole history unto itself. But this gun was very, very long-lived, and some places still issue them in certain regards, although we're really down to a surplus market. But this is an easily 100-year-plus service life for a rifle that really wasn't the best even when it came out. But the production numbers for World War I were very high, and then World War II even higher still. So there were just lots of these around and available for use. Now, what is it you suppose that grabbed them so much about that that they thought, okay, even if it, even with the drawbacks that it has, this is what we're going to continue using in production for 20, 30 years? When, when, of course, they, they, they saw other models. They knew other models. This is where Russia and Italy have something in common. This is what they were already making. In order to switch the horses midstream just seemed insanity to them. Whenever it was peaceful and they had the material to actually do the changeovers, it wasn't a priority. And then in war, there was no time to make it. Like, there was no material even though it was a priority. So this is just one of those things where you get stuck doing what you were doing. There's also probably a little bit of national sentiment where it's like, ours is just as good as the other one. And then honestly, there is a sort of realistic material cost, which is a lot of people have complained that all these bolt actions seem very similar. This is one of the less good bolt actions, but it still mostly works the same as the others. So how much money and time are we willing to throw, and reputation, by the way, are we willing to throw at a problem 
that really puts us at 10% less than the other guy or 5% less than the other guy. Like, how much are we really bidding to have the best bolt action when instead we could put that effort into artillery or tactics or something like that? So that's how things like this get stuck for a very long time. Oh, that makes sense. I hadn't thought of it that way, to think of how your, your defense budget actually works and stuff, where you're actually allotting the money. Okay, cool. That, well, that's great. So, and where do we go from here? We have one more Mosin, because this was the main rifle for the war. In this case, we have something that would have been a very rare sight in World War I, but it did exist. This is the Cavalry Mosin. Now you can tell this is a lot handier and it's honestly got some pretty mean recoil. Now this one is still in its original configuration because these didn't get quite the same update for the Spitzer cartridge because long range shooting was never really a thing with these so no need to overhaul the entire system. So this one's much more true to the original. So if we take a closer look because these are fairly small components, we will see a full handguard. And like I said, just with the earlier Dragoons, this one's gonna wrap all the way around and it's actually split from years of use that way because that's exactly what it would do. This is a very delicate part. We have a shortened rear sight. And then otherwise, this is a bog standard Mosin. Now, the interesting thing about this gun is that its little brother would see much bigger production in World War II because this is really going to be the precursor to the M38 carbine, which is almost the same length, maybe just a little bit extra to avoid some of that unpleasantness of a full powered Spitzer cartridge blowing out of such a small barrel. But this is a handy dandy, ready to ride, ready to go on your back on horseback carbine. This is the 1907. This is very rare. And so I am very thankful for its loan. Can you estimate any kind of numbers you might see with this with the cavalry? And would this be just the main cavalry? I mean, I don't know what kind of uh, rifles, for example, the Cossack cavalry was using and things like that. Would this be just the uh, Imperial cavalry or what are we talking? This gun was extremely limited use. I've seen a number of different claims and I'm thankfully working through some very good source material now to absolutely say for sure where it went. I could say what is most commonly known on the internet. I found that is often wrong. I wanna be doubly careful before I say anything. I do know, however, that this was not normally what you would find if you found a man on horseback. Nine times out of 10 or greater, if you see a Russian on horseback and you're looking at your photos, he's carrying one of these guys. Although I have seen photos of Cossacks that have the carbine, I have seen it in unusual places. So if you tell me it's just for gendarmerie or something like that, I'm gonna tell you, I've seen it in photos with other people right up at the front line. It did exist, it may have been redispersed, it may have been you know, stolen or used, I don't know. But it, it turns up in unusual places. So I'm still tracking the history of this one. But easily nine out of 10 mounted Russians are going to have the Dragoon. This is way more common. And Dragoon is just sort of the colloquial name for this. This was used to Cossacks. This is used by Dragoons. As a matter of fact, a lot of the Cossack ones have unique markings so that you can tell where they had turned up. This is a whole history unto itself, and I have a whole episode that's going to come out on this family of guns in the near future. All right, well, uh, bring on the next one. Yep. All right, so we're out of the Mosin, and I want to just say that Russia used a lot of French surplus weapon weapons during the war. So, Gras, uh, and Bertier especially among those. And then they also had their own single shot Berdan rifles. I'm not gonna get into that today. They even had Vetterly. Like they, they used a lot of things that they could get wherever they could get for rear echelon work. But if we're talking about things that might've actually, well, might've actually did fight up front, then the next sort of most common gun we're gonna see I'm gonna skip. I'm gonna go to the third most common, which most people think of thanks to some recent video game developments. This is the Russian contract Winchester 1895. Now this was Winchester's attempt to get into a big cartridge, smokeless, and repeat, vertical magazine repeating rifle. A lot of people say that this gun was developed so they could use stripper clips, but actually that wasn't on their mind at the time. At the time they were worried about balance because a tubular magazine means that the point of balance shifts as you shoot your ammo. A vertical magazine, your point of balance stays the same all the way throughout. And then later on, thankfully, this could be adapted for stripper clips because the Russians would buy these in World War I. And they're actually the only significant military contract for this particular gun. Now, uh, I'm gonna stay backed out for just a second because it's gonna take a big sweep to see this, but this is a lever action with a throwback bolt feeding five rounds vertically from a stripper clip. Bolt back forward, hammer back, and then you can fire. Now, I'll go ahead and zoom in so you can actually see the gun. There we go. Again, stripper clip bridge has been added so that we can feed our cartridges like normal Russian ammo would have come prepackaged on a stripper clip. And then down here, we have a lever action with a sort of safety lock. You have to have your hand inside in order to get that guy to therefore unlock, releasing the action open. Browning designed this action to sort of spit itself up like a sea anemone, all this material coming out the bottom is so that you can have a nice easy sweep 
of this arm. You don't have to go sweeping all the way back around until your elbow is uncomfortable. You can stop here, and yet we get a longer stroke out of the bolt because of this sort of coming out the bottom. If this didn't come out the bottom, like the early toggle lock levers, we would have to go all the way back around in order to get a bolt this long to come back. So this is just sort of getting the right angle. The problem with this is it exposes the action to a lot of debris if you're operating it while in the debris. Now it seals up very well as long as you're not actually in the mud when you're pumping it. So get your hands up out of the mud while you're using it, gentlemen. No, this is probably the only frontline lever gun of the war. Now, we did see in some of our CN Arsenal episodes that the British had the 1892 that they would use for naval service, and then we saw the French had some 3030s, some 94s. They were using them primarily sort of, sort of like air guards and couriers. They were really not frontline rifles. This, however, was a frontline rifle. It's not an uncommon sight. And it was very, very common to see with Baltic state country soldiers. So a lot of the recruits from the Baltics ended up with Winchester 95s. And they proved to be actually fairly good guns for the front. The only problem with them is that mechanically, they're extremely complicated. Like there's way more that goes into this gun in terms of production and maintenance than a bolt action. And I know a lot of people want to defend the lever action to death, but this particular gun came to us in rough shape, but not impossibly rough shape. It just had 100 years of use. And we've had a lot of bolt actions with 100 years of use. And I'm gonna tell you, I had to do a lot more repairs to get this gun up and running. It's far finicker, it's far more finicky with all these moving parts that have to interact just so and line up just so. So it's not a strong military rifle, but it was available and the production lines could be tooled up fast enough to get like 300,000 of these to the Russians for the war. And was it, was it uh, comparatively well liked by the actual soldiers at the time? Uh, I mean, away from, let's say, away from the Baltics. Or was it, I mean, some of these, I, I don't know which were popular among the men. I know the high command said we're going to use this as a standard, but that's different from being popular among the actual men who have to use them, right? And the other thing is you don't often get the choice. So a lot of people coming from a more modern understanding, especially from a video game perspective, think that you get to go to the rack and pick your gun. And so some Russians would pick this and some wouldn't. It's not the case. You were either issued this gun or you weren't. So it's not like you get a lot of comparison between any particular types of weapon unless one was substituted for another overall for a unit. And so there's not a lot of comparison between this and the Mosin. However, I will say that I have not seen a negative report about it and even a few compliments coming from especially the Baltic states. This has became very iconic for sort of those uh, early revolutionaries who a lot of the Baltic states were the first to sort of push for the revolution. And so a lot of those people that came into the cities were carrying these guys first and foremost because that's what they were issued as second standard rifles. So they sort of had that association, but it quickly faded as more and more showed up with actual regular infantry rifles and these became harder and harder to service. So when you had uh, groups like the Latvian Rifles, who were some of the first uh, 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 who joined the October Revolution and later fighting in the Civil War, would you see them a lot initially? And then as, this, as the Russian Civil War progressed, you just see whatever weapons you could get your ha hands on? Or would they manage to continue to have these same issued rifles that they had you know, over a period of two or three years? Or is that beyond the scope of what we're talking about today? Right. If you look up the Latvian rifles now and just look for some photos, I can almost guarantee you that the first five are going to have 1895s in the photos. These were the standard rifles for those guys. Uh, that's where they saw their widest issuance. So yeah, you're going to see a lot of this gun and it's going to stay for quite a while. And honestly, most of the photos will still include this gun. It was good for a couple, you know, it's going to last for a decade and a half of service easy and before it starts to really develop wear from heavy use. So it's not a terrible gun. The problem is, at the time, people would change out their military rifles during this sort of smokeless and repeating rifle revolution. You're seeing rifles change every 10 to 15 years easy. Well, then you don't need a gun that lasts that long realistically, although these were still built to last. Military use is very, very rough on a gun. And these things lasted for you know, 20, 30 years, which is more than enough for that time period. But then we see a lot of countries really sit on their arms after World War I because of overproduction. And so the guns that last for a century at a time, those are the better guns in retrospect. So, yeah, also very expensive to produce by comparison. Very, very expensive. And nobody's domestically producing this. Only Winchester produced it. Like, nobody took up a license and started making copies of this because why would you? It's very complicated. So, uh, easily seen with the Latvians right away. As things progress, just whatever sort of works its way in, as long as it uses the same ammo, people are happy. So if you're, you know, a Latvian and yours breaks down and there's a Mosin right there, it's the same 
ammo, so you're not really worried about it. You can issue these indiscriminately within a unit, so if you had these and Mosins in the same unit, especially during the revolution, easy to go because you just shove the same ammo, same clip, same everything in it. Very good rifle for that purpose. Uh, again, it's just one of those things that this is the kind of gun that when you start issuing them in the hundreds of thousands, you need field armors to have parts on hand because over hundreds of thousands of units, you're going to see more statistical breakdowns than Mosins. So, um, now you said, uh, the intro to that, you said that was the third, what did you say? How did you describe it? This should be about the third most common rifle in Russia. The second most common will actually surprise a lot of people. And I shouldn't say, it's actually two models blended into one, but I'm going to talk about the second model when we talk about our Japanese special. So, I think I might have tipped my hand, but this is the Japanese Arisaka Type 30. This is a Japanese bolt action and sort of their first smoke list repeating rifle. This was set up by, uh, there was a commission headed by Nadia Akira Arisaka. He chose, like he got the final stamp on everything, but realistically it's a Japanese commission, like the German commission rifle. They went around the world, they found the best features they thought, put them into one gun. This thing is uniquely Japanese with a lot of sort of German influence. And this gun would have been abandoned right after the turn of the century in favor of the Type 38, which we will talk about again in the Japanese special. But as part of that, a lot of these were either captured in the Russo-Japanese War or sold surplus to Russia later on. These guns were extremely and oddly common in Russia during the war. So much so that the 6.5 millimeter Japanese cartridge, when the Russians were looking for a milder cartridge to use for an automatic rifle they were developing, the Fedorov Avtomat, which I do not have today, those are extremely rare, uh, they used the Japanese cartridge. So that's how plain this gun was in service. And if you really look at uh, Russian historical photos of the period, it's not hard to find Arisaka mixed in amongst the rank. Now, if you'd like, I can take a closer look and we can see this Japanese original. So this gun is again a bolt action, again a cock on open, or rather here, let me check this out. Sorry, cock on close, I should say, oh, there. Partial cock on open, so it notches back just a bit for you, and then mostly cock on close. I shouldn't speak so fast. Now, uh, again, over here, this is very prized by US collectors, is that you still have your Imperial Mon, and then we have our Type 30 markings down here. The Mon, during World War II, when rifles were captured, these and others that were still in use, uh, would have been ground off in order for them to save a little face at the end. This was sort of the Imperial ownership mark. Now, for issue to Russians, it was probably just canceled unless they had captured it during the Russo-Japanese War. So you just see some either X's or some ring outs, although ring outs are generally for school use, but normally it would be defaced, not completely removed. Completely removed is usually a World War II thing. Now this one, of course, is intact. So these are also sort of nicknamed by the Chinese as the golden hook rifle because of the unique safety, which is a pull and turn in order to put her in safe. It's basically a big decocker and then boom, you're back out and running. Now, compared to the Mosin, this is actually fairly advanced. There's no exposed parts. It's very mud resistant. Uh, and then it has a staggered flush magazine. The only problem really is that light sort of probably still bottlenose cartridge for Russia for a lot of it. And then later they would introduce like a spitzer, but it's a very light spitzer. So really the ammo is the limitation on this. Otherwise it's a fairly good gun, fairly complicated internal bolt, but realistically still easy to service. These things served pretty well for Russia on a number of fronts, including the front line. Now, is, is that all the guns you had for us today or did you have something else? No, that is it for Russia at this time. Again, there's going to be other sort of emergency style single shots and things like that, old black powder designs. But realistically, these are what we're gonna see if we look at photos from Russia from World War One. You're gonna see a lot of Mosins. You're gonna see a lot of uh, M95 Winchesters. You're going to see uh, the Arisakas. Now, um, some of those you'll see more than others. Like even that, like the carbine Mosin I've shown you is gonna be a lot less common in photos than say the Arisaka. You're gonna see Arisakas all over the place. Now it's gonna be a mix of 30s and 38s, but again, we'll talk about the 38s some other time. Okay, well, Othias, thank you very much for taking the time to join us here live. And those of you who are not seeing this live are probably seeing the edited version. Um, <clears throat> now, he said that there was, there was a big connection between uh, Russia and France during the First World War and before because they were tight, tight, tight allies before the war began. So if you'd like to see our special episode about the French rifles of the war, you can click right here for that. And do not forget to visit Othias' channel, CN Arsenal, to learn everything you ever wanted to know and way, 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 way much more, nerdier more, about all of the guns that he covers on his channel. There are links below. And also, do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.